Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm in the middle of my third week of teaching on living in the balance of grace and faith. This is a 200-page book that I have. This is the very first book that I ever wrote. The first one was only like 50 or 60 pages. I've expanded it, so this is new and improved. But this is the same subject, and I'm giving this book away. It's a 200-plus page book, and I'm making this as a gift. Of course, people say, how can you do that? It's my partners who've enabled me to do this, and uh, we want you to have it so much that we're just making it available free. If you can give, I would encourage you to do so. That would enable us to be able to give this to other people who can't afford it. But we really do want you to have this, and this goes into a lot more detail than what I'm able to do here on our television program. I've already basically given the foundation of this teaching, and that is that grace is what God does. Faith is what we do in response to God's grace. And one of the biggest mistakes in the body of Christ is people think faith is something we do to gain a response from God. That's not true. God, by grace, has already done everything, and faith only appropriates what God has already done. If you are trying to use faith to move God, then that's not biblical faith. That's what the Bible calls works. That's performance, and that will actually stop the power of God. God is not going to flow through you based on your goodness and your holiness. Anything that you receive from God has to come through what Jesus did and you putting faith in what He has already done. That's basically what I said during the first two weeks of this teaching. Then this week I've been starting to illustrate this, and I started yesterday talking out of Genesis chapter 2 that after God created the heavens and the earth, He rested from all of the work which He had created and made. And this didn't mean that He was tired. He didn't rest because He was tired. He rested because it was complete. It was perfect. He didn't create Adam and Eve first and then them have to tread water for four days until there was land. He didn't wait until they got hungry and then He created food for them. He didn't wait until they needed to breathe and then He created oxygen. He already created everything that we would ever need and it was so perfect that He was able to rest. He has never created anything since creation. The only thing that has ever been created, the only new creation since the book of Genesis is you and I. When we got born again, we are a new creation. And in the spiritual realm, there is a perfect parallel between what Jesus did when He created the heavens and the earth and what He did when He created that new spirit on the inside of us. In the same way that everything was created perfect and He's never had to do anything more to make it better, He created it perfect and He gave it the ability to procreate. The Lord doesn't have to get up and create new cattle. He doesn't have to create new people. He gave us the ability to procreate did you know that there's a misunderstanding about this? And some people think, well, you can't have children if God doesn't want you to have children. I disagree with that. God gave you the power to create, to procreate. Did you know that when uh, prostitutes get pregnant and have babies and when people get pregnant and they're going to kill those babies, it's, that's not God who planned that and made that happen. God gave you the ability to produce children. Now, it is God's power. I'm not saying that He isn't involved. Psalms 139 says that even when you were in your mother's womb, God knew all about you and wrote your days in a book. Je Jeremiah chapter 1, God told Jeremiah, before I formed you in the belly, before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you and ordained you to be a prophet. And so I'm not saying that God isn't involved, but it's not God directly creating. He creates through people. He gave you the power to procreate. And some people don't understand this, and so they don't use any restraint, any physical restraint whatsoever, and they just feel like, well, they couldn't have children if it wasn't God's will. I actually met one guy who threw one wife, an Amish lady, they had 22 kids. That is unbelievable. And they just believe that, you know what, they couldn't have children if God didn't want them to have it. Well, if you use that same logic, well, then... A prostitute couldn't have a child. It must be God's will for prostitutes to get pregnant. It must be God's will for all the people who abort babies 
TO GET PREGNANT. NO, GOD GAVE US THE POWER TO PROCREATE. GOD ISN'T PERSONALLY, INDIVIDUALLY CREATING PEOPLE. HE GAVE US THAT POWER. SO ANYWAY, THE REASON I'M SAYING ALL OF THIS IS TO SAY THAT GOD IS NOT CREATING NEW THINGS. HE RESTED BECAUSE IT WAS COMPLETE. AND THEN ADAM AND EVE WERE CREATED AT THE VERY END OF THAT SIXTH DAY, AND THE MOMENT THAT, that THEY WERE CREATED, THEY ENTERED IN TO GOD'S REST. WHERE EVERYTHING WAS ALREADY PROVIDED FOR THEM, ALL THEY HAD TO DO WAS JUST REACH OUT AND SAY THANK YOU. NOW, THIS DID NOT MEAN THAT BECAUSE GOD CREATED FOOD FOR THEM THAT GOD WAS GOING TO PUT IT IN THEIR MOUTH AND AUTOMATICALLY MAKE THEM EAT IT. HE DIDN'T INTRAVENIOUSLY PUT THIS FOOD INTO THEM. THEY HAD TO DO SOMETHING. LIKE, FOR INSTANCE, IF IT WAS A BANANA, THEY HAD TO TAKE THE BANANA AND THEY HAD TO PEEL IT. BUT DID THAT MAKE GOD CREATE THE BANANA? NO, GOD CREATED THE FRUIT BEFORE they, THEY WERE CREATED BEFORE THE NEED WAS THERE, THE SUPPLY WAS ALREADY THERE, BUT IT DIDN'T WORK AUTOMATICALLY. THEY HAD TO DO SOMETHING. THEY REACHED OUT, PEELED THE BANANA, AND ate IT. SEE, THAT'S LIKE GRACE AND FAITH. GOD BY GRACE HAS ALREADY PROVIDED EVERYTHING, BUT DOES THAT MEAN THAT IT'S AUTOMATICALLY GOING TO WORK? NO, YOU GOT TO DO SOMETHING. BUT YOUR FAITH DOESN'T MAKE GOD RESPOND TO YOU. YOUR FAITH IS YOUR POSITIVE RESPONSE TO GOD. SO NOW LET ME TURN OVER TO HEBREWS CHAPTER 4. AGAIN, I KNOW THAT I JUST WENT THROUGH THAT QUICKLY. I SPENT A LOT MORE TIME ON THAT YESTERDAY. PLEASE GET THIS BOOK. PLEASE GET THE... WE'VE GOT CD'S, DVD'S, USB. I'VE GOT A STUDY GUIDE AND THINGS THAT WILL HELP YOU TO GET THIS. BUT IN HEBREWS CHAPTER 4, IT'S TALKING ABOUT THE ISRAELITES THAT CAME OUT OF THE LAND OF EGYPT. AND GOD NEVER INTENDED FOR THEM TO SPEND 40 YEARS IN THE WILDERNESS. THAT WAS NOT GOD'S WILL. THEY DID THAT TO THEMSELVES WHEN THEY REBELLED AT GOD AND REFUSED TO OBEY HIM AND GOT AFRAID OF THE GIANTS. BUT he, HE WANTED TO BRING THEM INTO THE PROMISED LAND, AND THIS IS WHAT IT'S TALKING ABOUT HERE IN HEBREWS CHAPTER 4. LET ME JUST BACK UP A FEW VERSES INTO HEBREWS CHAPTER 3. IN VERSE 15, IT SAYS, WHILE IT IS SAID, TODAY, IF YOU WILL HEAR HIS VOICE, HARDEN NOT YOUR HEARTS AS IN THE PROVOCATION, FOR SOME OF THEM WHEN THEY HAD HEARD, DID PROVOKE, HOWBEIT NOT ALL THAT CAME OUT OF EGYPT BY MOSES, BUT WITH WHOM WAS HE GRIEVED FORTY YEARS? WAS IT NOT WITH THEM THAT HAD SINNED, WHOSE CARCASSES FELL IN THE WILDERNESS? AND TO WHOM SWEAR HE THAT THEY SHOULD NOT ENTER INTO HIS REST, BUT TO THEM THAT BELIEVED NOT? SO WE SEE THAT THEY COULD NOT ENTER IN BECAUSE OF UNBELIEF. SO GOD HAD PROVIDED SOMETHING BETTER FOR THEM THAN WHAT THEY EXPERIENCED. HE PROVIDED THEM INHERITING THIS PROMISED LAND AND HE WAS GOING TO GET RID OF THE GIANTS. THEY WOULD BE ABLE TO MOVE INTO HOMES THAT WERE MADE BY GIANTS. MAN, WHAT A GREAT DEAL. THEY WERE GOING TO HAVE FIELDS THAT HAD ALREADY BEEN CULTIVATED, ALL THE ROCKS TAKEN OUT, AND THEY ALREADY HAD CROPS PLANTED. THEY HAD ALREADY DEALT WITH ALL OF THE WEEDS. THEY HAD ALREADY DEALT WITH ALL OF THE BAD BEASTS AND HAD GOTTEN RID OF THEM. THEY HAD ALL OF THESE THINGS, AND GOD HAD THIS GOOD PLAN FOR THEM, BUT THEY DIDN'T ENTER IN BECAUSE OF THEIR UNBELIEF. THEN IN CHAPTER 4, HEBREWS CHAPTER 4, VERSE 1, IT SAYS, LET US THEREFORE FEAR, LEST A PROMISE BEING LEFT US OF ENTERING INTO HIS REST, ANY OF YOU SHOULD SEEM TO COME SHORT OF IT. SO HE'S USING WHAT HAPPENED WITH THE ISRAELITES AS BEING SOMETHING THAT w it ALSO APPLIES TO US. IN THE SAME WAY THAT GOD BROUGHT THEM OUT OF EGYPT, BUT THEY DIDN'T ENTER INTO THE REST, INTO THE FULL BLESSING, OF WHAT HE HAD FOR THEM BECAUSE OF THEIR UNBELIEF. HE SAYS THE SAME WITH US. YOU CAN BE BORN AGAIN AND YET NOT ENTER IN TO ALL OF THE BLESSINGS THAT GOD HAS FOR YOU BECAUSE OF UNBELIEF. AND HE LIKENS IT TO A REST. HE GOES ON TO SAY IN VERSE 2, HE SAYS, FOR UNTO US WAS THE GOSPEL PREACHED AS WELL AS UNTO THEM, BUT THE WORD PREACHED DID NOT PROFIT THEM, NOT BEING MIXED WITH FAITH IN THEM THAT HEARD IT. Oh, THAT IS ONE POWERFUL STATEMENT RIGHT THERE. DID YOU KNOW YOU HAVE TO MIX FAITH WITH THE WORD IN ORDER FOR IT TO RELEASE ITS POWER? THERE ARE PEOPLE THAT WILL READ THE BIBLE, BUT THEY READ IT LIKE ANY OTHER BOOK. THEY READ IT JUST WITH THEIR MIND. THEY AREN'T READING IT WITH THEIR HEART. ROMANS CHAPTER 10, VERSE 10, IT SAYS, FOR WITH THE HEART MAN BELIEVES UNTO RIGHTEOUSNESS, AND WITH THE MOUTH CONFESSION IS MADE UNTO SALVATION. FAITH COMES OUT OF THE HEART, NOT OUT OF THE HEAD. IF YOU JUST READ THE BIBLE WITH YOUR HEAD JUST TO GET FACTS, THAT COULD BENEFIT YOU IN THE SENSE THAT ONCE THOSE FACTS ARE IN THERE, GOD COULD QUICKEN THEM TO HIM AND IT COULD GO DOWN INTO YOUR HEART. BUT A BETTER WAY TO DO IT IS TO JUST READ THE BIBLE WITH YOUR HEART. 
It really wasn't written to your head. It's written to your heart. You need to read the Bible with your heart. You need to keep your heart open and let the Holy Spirit inspire it. The Holy Spirit inspired people to write this Bible, and if you are born again, you have the Holy Spirit in you, and the Holy Spirit will quicken it to you and make it come alive and explain it to you. So you need to read it with your heart. But if you don't mix faith with the Word of God, then it profits you nothing, is what this said. And there are so many people that they have read the Bible, they've got facts, but they don't have it in their heart. It's not mixed with faith, and it has profited them nothing. I actually heard a story about a man who had memorized every word in the New Testament, and he made his living in a carnival uh, betting people that they could ask for any verse, and he'd be able to quote it. And so they'd give him some obscure verse, and he would quote it, and he'd get money from it. That's how he made his living. But the guy wasn't a believer. He didn't even believe that there was a God. Man, that's, that's weird. But you can read the Bible. You can even memorize the Bible. But if it's not mixed with faith, it won't profit you. It won't release its power that's in there. Then he goes on to say in the next verse, he says, For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all of his works. That's a quotation back to Genesis chapter 2, those verses that I read yesterday and again today about that on the seventh day God rested from all of his works. And so this is talking about that there is a rest that we enter into in God, and it likens it to this Sabbath rest that God took where it says He rested from all of His works on the seventh day. And then it goes in verse 5, and it says, In this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. So uh, what he's saying here is that God rested on the seventh day, not because He was worn out, but because everything was complete and provided. There was nothing left for Him to do. And then later, Psalms chapter 95, he's quoting this thing and he's saying, again, if they shall enter into my rest. And so this was spoken through David about entering into the rest. So it shows you, and he goes on to say in verse 6, he says, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again he limited a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. So he quotes this uh, statement from David twice, and the point that he's making is, it's wordy here in the King James, but the point that he's making is when God rested on the seventh day, he, there was a rest, and Adam and Eve immediately entered into that rest. But then the children of Israel, when they came out, they were promised to enter into a rest, the promised land, but they didn't enter in because of unbelief. And it's obvious because David, which was over 400 years after they had come out of the land of Egypt, David in his writings, again, I believe it's Psalms 96, David said, after so long a time, if you can enter into the rest. So the children of Israel entering into the promised land did not fulfill what God said about entering into his rest because 400 and something years later, here was David still talking to people about it. So then he goes on to say in verse 9, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. So here is the writer of Hebrews writing in the first century A.D. talking about that there is still a rest for believers. And it wasn't fulfilled when the Jews entered into the promised land. This is what it goes on to say, uh, that it wasn't fulfilled uh, when Jesus... Let me look at these verses here. Anyway, right here, it's talking about Jesus, and that's the uh, New Testament name for Joshua. It's talking about that when Joshua brought the children of Israel into the land of Egypt, or into the promised land, is not when this fulfillment came. There is a rest for us. Anyway, that's wordy in the King James, and it's wordy the way I said it. But the point is that there is a rest for people, and it's a Sabbath rest comparable to what happened when Adam and Eve were created, and then they entered into this rest where God had already created everything for them, and all they had to do is just reach out and partake it and say thank you. Well, likewise, now that we are born again, there is a rest for believers. 
WHEN YOU GET BORN AGAIN IN YOUR SPIRIT, GOD PLACES ON THE INSIDE OF YOU EVERYTHING THAT YOU WILL EVER NEED THROUGHOUT THE REST OF YOUR CHRISTIAN LIFE. BOY, THAT'S A CONCEPT THAT VERY, VERY, VERY FEW PEOPLE HAVE. IF A PERSON GETS SICK, THEY THINK, WELL, GOD, YOU CAN HEAL, AND THEN THEY START ASKING AND THEY PLEAD, AND THEY WILL EVEN SAY THINGS LIKE, STRETCH FORTH YOUR HAND AND TOUCH ME AND HEAL THIS PERSON. GOD DOESN'T NEED TO STRETCH FORTH HIS HAND. HE PLACED ON THE INSIDE OF YOU THE SAME POWER THAT RAISED CHRIST FROM THE DEAD. THAT'S WHAT IT SAYS IN EPHESIANS CHAPTER 1, VERSES 19 AND 20. YOU HAVE THE SAME RESURRECTION POWER ON THE INSIDE OF YOU THAT RAISED JESUS FROM THE DEAD. THAT'S MORE THAN ENOUGH TO DEAL WITH YOUR CANCER, TO DEAL WITH WHATEVER IT IS THAT YOU'RE DEALING WITH. YOU GOT RESURRECTION POWER. IT'S NOT OUT THERE. YOU DON'T NEED TO PRAY IT DOWN. IT'S IN YOU. YOU NEED TO DRAW IT OUT. SOMEBODY'S THINKING, WHAT'S THE DIFFERENCE, WHETHER IT'S COMING FROM THE OUTSIDE OR WHETHER IT'S COMING FROM THE INSIDE? IT'S EASIER TO RELEASE SOMETHING THAT YOU ALREADY HAVE THAN IT IS TO GO GET SOMETHING THAT YOU DON'T HAVE. YOU KNOW, IF, SAY, FOR INSTANCE, I WANTED THIS CUP, BUT IT WAS OVER THERE, AND I SAID, I'M GOING TO REACH OVER THERE AND GRAB THIS CUP, BUT it, I DON'T HAVE IT YET. SOMETHING COULD HAPPEN. YOU KNOW, THERE, could, there could, MIGHT BE SOME REASON THAT I MIGHT NOT BE ABLE TO REACH OVER THERE, BUT IF I ALREADY HAVE IT IN MY HAND, HOW AM I GOING TO DOUBT THAT I'LL GET WHAT I'VE ALREADY GOT? HERE'S ANOTHER EXAMPLE. YOU KNOW, WHEN I WAS IN MY POVERTY DAYS, I HAD JUST GOTTEN OUT OF VIETNAM. I HAD JUST GOTTEN MARRIED. JAMIE AND I WERE PASTORING OUR FIRST LITTLE CHURCH. AND THE BIBLE THAT I HAD WITH ME THROUGH VIETNAM WAS MILDEWED. I HAD WRITTEN IN IT SO MUCH THAT MOST OF THE PAGES WERE JUST TOTAL SCOTCH TAPE. IT WAS HELD TOGETHER BY SCOTCH TAPE. AND SOME OF THE PAGES, e ENTIRE CHAPTERS AND BOOKS OF THE BIBLE HAD FALLEN OUT OF MY BIBLE. IT WAS JUST BASICALLY NEARLY USELESS. AND HERE I WAS PASTORING A CHURCH, AND I DIDN'T EVEN HAVE A FULL BIBLE. AND I DIDN'T HAVE VERY MUCH MONEY. AND SO I STARTED BELIEVING GOD FOR ENOUGH MONEY TO GO GET A NEW BIBLE. SOME OF YOU MAY THINK I, I'M EXAGGERATING, BUT we, WE WENT WEEKS AT A TIME WITHOUT FOOD. I MEAN, WE HAD NOTHING, AND I DIDN'T HAVE $20 TO GO BUY A BIBLE. AND IT TOOK ME A WHILE. IT TOOK ME A COUPLE OF MONTHS TO BELIEVE FOR AN EXTRA $20 SO THAT I COULD GO GET A BIBLE. AND DURING THAT PERIOD OF TIME, THE DEVIL WAS JUST POUNDING ME, SAYING, SOME MAN OF GOD YOU ARE. YOU, can, you DON'T EVEN HAVE ENOUGH MONEY TO GO GET A BIBLE. YOU DON'T EVEN HAVE A WHOLE BIBLE. HOW CAN YOU PRAY FOR PEOPLE TO BE SAVED AND HEALED AND DELIVERED AND THINGS LIKE THIS? AND HE WAS JUST TELLING ME YOU'RE A FAILURE. IT'LL NEVER WORK. AND UNTIL I GOT THAT BIBLE, I MEAN, I DEALT WITH DOUBT ABOUT THAT NEARLY EVERY SINGLE DAY. I MEAN, I COULDN'T GO MORE THAN A FEW MINUTES WITHOUT HAVING SOME NEGATIVE THOUGHT COME ABOUT YOU. YOU'LL NEVER GET IT. IT'S NOT GOING TO WORK. YOU'RE A FAILURE. BUT DID YOU KNOW WHEN I FINALLY GOT THE MONEY, I BOUGHT THE BIBLE, I HAD MY NAME ENGRAVED ON IT. AND WHEN I WALKED OUT OF THAT BOOKSTORE AND I HAD MY BIBLE IN MY HAND, I NEVER DOUBTED THAT I'D GET IT ONCE I HAD IT. AND I KNOW SOME OF YOU ARE THINKING, well, THAT DOESN'T EVEN MAKE SENSE. WHY WOULD YOU DOUBT YOU'RE GOING TO GET SOMETHING IF YOU'VE ALREADY GOT IT? THAT'S MY POINT. SEE, THERE ARE SOME OF YOU SAYING, OH, YEAH, I BELIEVE THAT I'M HEALED. BUT, MAN, THEN YOU HAVE DOUBT. YOU CAN SEE YOURSELF DYING. YOU JUST WONDER, HOW LONG IS THIS GOING TO DRAG ON? AND THE REASON YOU AREN'T REJOICING IN STUFF IS BECAUSE YOU BELIEVE YOU CAN HAVE IT. IT CAN HAPPEN. GOD COULD PROVIDE IT, BUT YOU DON'T BELIEVE YOU'VE ALREADY GOT IT. ONCE YOU BELIEVE YOU'VE ALREADY GOT IT, ALL OF THE DOUBT ABOUT GETTING IT LEAVES. MAN, I'VE ALREADY GOT MY BIBLE. I DON'T DOUBT THAT I'LL GET IT. I'VE ALREADY GOT IT. I BELIEVE THAT I'VE ALREADY GOT MY HEALING. IT'S INSIDE OF ME. IT'S NOT OUT THERE. I DON'T HAVE TO PRAY IT DOWN. SEE, IF I HAD TO DO SOMETHING TO MOTIVATE GOD TO STRETCH FORTH HIS HAND AND HEAL ME, THERE IS AN ELEMENT OF DOUBT THERE. HE HASN'T DONE IT YET, AND HE MIGHT NOT DO IT. BUT IF I BELIEVE THAT HE'S ALREADY DONE IT, THAT BY HIS STRIPES I WAS HEALED, 1 PETER 2, 24, HOW CAN I DOUBT THAT I'LL BE HEALED IF I'M ALREADY HEALED? AND I KNOW THAT THERE'S PEOPLE WATCHING THIS PROGRAM THAT, BOY, YOU'RE JUST SAYING THIS IS CONFUSING. IT'S ONLY CONFUSING BECAUSE PEOPLE THINK THAT ALL THAT THERE IS TO YOU IS JUST THIS PHYSICAL AND EMOTIONAL REALM. 
And so if you've got like a pain in your body, you say, how can I believe that I'm healed? How can I believe that I've already been healed when I've still got pain in my body? My doctor's report proves I've got it. That's because you only think in the physical, natural realm. But there's also a spiritual part of you. And in the spirit, you already have raising from the dead power. You have the same power on the inside of you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, what it says in Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. It's not out there. It's already here. You've already got it. How can you doubt that you're going to get it? Well, it's because you're looking in the mirror and all you think that it, you think all there is to reality is just this physical body and your mental, emotional part. But there's a spiritual part of you. And how do you access that? Romans chapter 5, verse 2 says, We have access by faith into this grace. God by grace has already put resurrection power on the inside of you. It's not out there. There is no question whether you will get it or not. You've already got it. I've got an entire teaching entitled, You've Already Got It, so quit trying to get it. You've already got it in your spirit, but it doesn't do any good to just stay in your spirit. You've got to draw it out. That's what faith does. Faith doesn't make God release power to you. He, by grace, has already put His power on the inside of you, the same power, the same anointing that raised Jesus from the dead. That's grace. But faith just releases what God has already put in you. It takes faith to believe that there is something more than what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. Faith reaches into that unseen realm, into that spiritual realm, and draws what is real in the spirit out into the physical realm. So see, faith doesn't make God do something. By grace, God has already placed within you everything that you will ever need throughout your entire life. You do not need more grace. You don't need God to do something new. You need faith to appropriate what God has already placed on the inside of you by grace. I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel and the programs that we have available. And I want to encourage you that you can get the materials that we've offered. Also, I'd like to encourage you to like our program and subscribe to what we're doing. We have a lot of material and I believe it'll be a real blessing to you. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you.